Dear Heavenly Father, we're happy, glad to be in your house today to worship you. Enter into our hearts and sit beside us and grant us your mercy and kindness and your love and may we respond accordingly in our lives. Thank you for loving us and for courageously giving your life for us. Forgiveness of sins is, is a happy life. Thank you, Father, for all that you've done in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's turn to page 167. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall.
Sunday evening, and on Tuesday, Evelyn and the girls went on one of their beach trips. So <laughs> they're, they're due back. They're due back today, and I hope that's it for a while as well. But uh, it is good to be back. We had a wonderful, wonderful trip, and Elizabeth's graduation was um, fantastic. Um, if you'll take a look at your bulletin, um, that's in the series, The Power of God for Salvation, to everyone who believes. And today's sermon is uh, propitiation. God is kind to sinners, Romans 3, 23 through 26. Uh, we'll also be having our next pulpit meeting uh, this afternoon at 1 o'clock. I talked to him yesterday and confirmed that. And don't forget uh, the ladies' craft days uh, are here. And this coming Friday, this coming Friday is the, uh, the next, uh, next ladies' uh, craft day. You know, I, I hope this will work out if there's any on Friday. And uh, so the, neither one, she or Jim, either one were. So if there's, any, if there's anything coming up by the end of the week, uh, we'll certainly reach out and, and let you all know that. Um, Bill Mitchell is back in the hospital. Uh, last Tuesday, uh, he was he was having some very serious issues at home. Um, uh, Wanda even had to call her daughter to help come get him up, and he was not doing well. So they took him to the emergency room uh, on Tuesday evening, and he had a very bad infection. So uh, they've been giving him antibiotics and. I got a uh, text message and a photograph uh, from Wanda uh, yesterday evening. Bill sitting up in the bed eating ice cream, so she said, he, uh, because she's so concerned about the shingles getting into her eyes. She has another doctor's appointment coming up on Friday. Um, Cookie talked to Cookie. She's just not feeling well. I uh, said she feels very badly that she can't be here, uh, but she was just not settling well. And that she would be back as soon as she could. Continue your prayers for Sylvia and Eloisa. I got another update from, uh, from Kathy improving. And uh, I hate to say, but I know we've been praying quite a bit for my good friend, Bill West. He passed away on June the 1st. So be in prayer for the West family. Uh, there are the latest copies of the uh, prayer list back on the back table. So if you don't have one, please plan on and he's not asleep, is he? <laughs> Maybe he's reading something. Okay. Um, tomorrow is Alan's birthday. Oh. So Alan, welcome to the old He says nothing. I can't believe you. Jake DeWall, a missionary to the Dominican Republic. We, uh, we met on Friday morning with the churches. So I have the latest update from him. Dear prayer partners, uh, it is the Lord's mercies uh, that we, excuse me, it is the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because of the passions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is his uh, faithfulness. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. We praise the Lord for his faithfulness to us during this furlough. What a blessing uh, this time has been. We just purchased and encouraged hearts. We have continued uh, traveling many miles uh, and, and, and to gain additional prayer and financial support. The Lord has been working this out on our behalf. He also says that his the church, even in their absence, their church is <coughs> continuing to grow. And uh, he says that the Dominicans are really getting involved. And he thinks one of the first things that they will be doing when they get back is, Lord willing, planning a new church, uh, not too far from where they are right now. So he's looking really forward to, to being able to do that. And another thing, too, that he mentions in his letter is when he gets back, he's 
says they have a need for another vehicle. So if anybody uh, has a little extra, and uh, also pray for the safety as uh, they get back home. So um, at this particular point, uh, let's have a prayer uh, for our church and for uh, our pulpit committee. Precious Lord God, we just thank you. We lift you up and praise you for all the bountiful blessings that we have. And Lord, even today, as we go in and do your work at the church today, that uh, we just ask your presence, your guidance, your direction, dear Lord, as we uh, continue to put together the necessary material. I'll pray for Buddy. Buddy's not feeling well today. We really need prayer, don't we, bro? We really do. Even those who are here need their prayer also. But there's no but. The light of the world is Jesus, too. chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, 
Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thy me from the secret laws. Keep back thy servant also from presumption. If you have your Bibles, I would ask for you to turn with me to this morning to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, probably a familiar text to many of you, forming a treaty and uh, uh, preaching from the, the narrative, the, the uh, text that have an account of an event in the Bible. I find it to be very challenging. And so please pray for grace for me next week. And then the, now on top of that, I'm doing something I've never done before. Um, this is part of a sermon in a part of series, so I can that. So. Romans chapter 3. Um, C.S. Lewis's book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, describes a scene in which the two heroines, uh, Susan and Lucy, uh, hold a conversation with Mr. and Mrs. Beaver. And the Beaver's a lion named Aslan, uh, representing Christ. And their conversation goes as follows. Susan says, oh, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Mrs. Beaver says that you will think about not safe. Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He and this conversation finds its foundation in part from our text here this morning. No one would ever treat a lion as if he were tame because no lion can ever truly be tamed. There's something awesome and beautiful about the lion, but his ferocity inspires, uh, he's holy in the sense that no one could possibly compare with him in any way. His character is absolutely perfect and without sin. His excellence is beyond our His glory is overwhelming. His standards and assessments are always absolutely right and perfectly fair. His holiness means that he alone possesses the authority to establish once and for all what is right and what is wrong, and the ability to perfectly enforce his standard. In other words, Jesus appeases God's wrath by faith. Now, we live in a day when preachers tell of a milk toast God. Uh, he's this benign, grandfatherly figure who, who snickers at our foibles like we snicker at a mis mischievous. That God could be angry is hardly consistent with the image that some people have of God. They cannot bring themselves to believe that the God of the Old Testament is the Jesus of the New Testament. There are some who cannot conceive of a God who would actually send anyone to hell, a doctrine known as universal. A logical word meaning to appease or to satisfy. Propitiation resolves this tension that, that we see, as it seems, to exist between God's holiness and God's love. Jesus endured God's wrath. We might experience the joy of God's love. To see someone else suffer to the extreme, that we might be spared the same, can only inspire one response. Humility. To look upon another's suffering for our sake in callous indifference to Jesus God's wrath, starting at verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, and the just Let me illustrate this passage with something we could wrap our minds around fairly easily. Husbands, have you ever done anything stupid and made the end of wife angry? <laughs> and wives, have you ever done the same maybe to your husband? Not so much as the husband doing it to the wife, right? <laughs> so husband's frustration and anger at you. Your act was an act of propitiation in that sense. Jesus is the propitiation for our sin. Now, why did Jesus need to be the propitiation? Verse 23 tells us that we all, each and every person who ever lived and ever will live, are sinners. 
In fact, it says there that we fell short of the glory of God. We talked about this last week, where glory is where God gets all the credit. And we sin because we try to take the credit for ourselves. We did not meet God's perfect standard call better than you, and you put your name in there and used profanity to call you names. How would you respond? Uh, it, it would infuriate you, wouldn't it? You, you'd be so angry, you'd, you'd see red, and somebody could measure your pulse by the veins throbbing on your forehead, right? <laughs> this is the height of ingratitude. And this gives us just the smallest glimpse of God's response to our sins. We need to understand rightly God's wrath. Let's use our anger as a point of reference. Have you ever been so angry that you shouted and screamed or, or just surrendered any sense of, of self-control? I think we've all been there a few times. And our anger tends to be quick in both its arousal and its duration. Uh, it, it's difficult to maintain our tantrums for long, and, and that's exactly what they are. They're tantrums. Uh, although we're, most of us here today are adults, uh, we, we think we're sophisticated, and tantrums are just for toddlers, you know. And if, if we were children, though, our expressions of anger would without a doubt be called tantrums. We don't call them tantrums because we're adults. We call them flying off the handle. Does that make you angry? God's anger is not a sudden change in his temperament, like all of a sudden he flies off the handle. God doesn't sit in, in heaven with a smile and someone doing something wrong, then he just, again, loses control. If, if we allow our anger to, to do what we call the slow boil, it becomes vindictive. And, and we justify our rude responses and behaviors toward the person who's the object of our anger because we assume they did whatever they did. God's anger is always provoked by sin. Nothing in God changes. His response isn't sudden. It's a part of his unchanging character. If our sin angers God, how can he be appeased? We read in Psalm 40, verse 6, Right sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened, burnt and sin offering hast thou not required. This with thou. How could that be? What does the Apostle Paul mean? God's holiness will never allow him to condone or to excuse sin. And this means that he extends mercy. 2 Peter 3 9 says, The Lord is not slack or slow concerning his promise. But he's long-suffering toward us, Lord, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That God withheld his anger shows that he wants us, us to turn to him. Have you ever tried to please someone who just will not be pleased? There are some people who are just obstinate. Impotent wrath ever be pleased? And the answer is found in this tension, apparent tension between love and holiness. Look at the end of verse 24 and into 25. Christ Jesus, whom God set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. We need to understand God's anger. We also need to understand who can appease God's anger. Non-Christian religions always require a worshiper to make some sort of sacrifice. He, even just a quick glance at the Old Testament leads us to believe that animal sacrifices could not appease God. If they could, there was little difference between them and their pagan neighbors, the Canaanites and the Philistines and so forth. What's the difference between the Old Testament sacrifices and the sacrifice of some tribe on a volcanic island tossing a teenage girl into the lava? Are, are the two sacrifices even the same? Well, the Old Testament sacrifices, which the psalmist realized didn't please God, were a picture of something. Yes, God established the Old Testament uh, system of sacrifice, but he wasn't satisfied with the sacrifices themselves. Let me illustrate it this way. If, if you're married or if you have a significant other, uh, do you remember when you would exchange pictures when you were dating? When, and you took that picture home and you framed it or you put it somewhere where you could see. Um, maybe here's another example for those of you who are grandparents. You, know, you ask any grandparent about, about their children and comes to the wall with the, you know, the folding <laughs> pictures, you know, and, or the cell phone now today, I guess. Uh, here, let me show you all the pictures, and you scroll through them. And you have these pictures, and but do these pictures ever truly satisfy you? No. They could never try, truly satisfy, because they're symbols of something 
far greater, the one that you love. And that's exactly what the sacrifices of the Old Testament were. They represented something far better. They represented Jesus and his redemptive work on the cross. The blood sacrifices showed that there was never anything that could be enough to sacrifice. The sacrifices were repeated day in, day out, for centuries. The Israelites could have sacrificed every animal on the planet, and it would not have been enough. There had to be a slaughter to an end. Verse 25 tells us that God ended the sacrifices through his son, Jesus Christ. He was the propitiation. He was the perfect and final sacrifice. Amen. And when Jesus died on the cross, he did all that was. Think about Jesus' fourth word from the cross. Cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And at that moment, the full weight of God's wrath fell upon Jesus. The sins of every person ever to live fell on his shoulders, and he drank to the bitter dregs from the cup of that prayer he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. And as horrific and extreme as Jesus' brutal torture and crucifixion was, this moment of abandonment held far more terror and suffering than anything physical Jesus endured. The moment the Father abandoned him to experience omnipotent wrath in our place. In Jesus Christ, God's righteousness, the harmony of his holiness and love shines forth brightly with hope for you and for me. We see that Jesus' death offers us friendship. What effect does this propitiation have on us? Well, it takes us to a day called the Day of Atonement on the Hebrew calendar. We know it better today as Yom Kippur. The tabernacle and later the temple had a room in which absolutely no one was allowed to enter. It was called the Holy of Holies, the room where the Ark of the Covenant rested. There was one exception. On the Day of Atonement, only the high priest could enter the room. He took the blood from a special sacrifice and he sprinkled it on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant called the Mercy. That act symbolically covered Israel's sins. In order to understand the significance, we could look at 1 John 2. He, Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. There are two ways to understand propitiation. Some believe this verse means that our sins were covered, which means the permanent removal of, of, of sin and guilt. Others believe the word refers to the, the cause of the covering, meaning that Christ's death removes our sin and guilt. The first refers to the result or the consequence, and the second refers to the cause. Does it matter which one we believe? Absolutely. I mean, are we just playing word games here? Well, let's consider this. Well, if propitiation is only the covering of sin and guilt, we have forgiveness. But our relationship with God is not assured. Forgiveness is important, but that's not all salvation is. A Christianity that never progresses beyond forgiveness is an immature Christianity. If we have only the forgiveness of sins, we, we can never hope to experience the joy of our Christianity. But we believe the second meaning of propitiation. Jesus' death was the way by which our sin and guilt was covered. Not only were we forgiven, friendship, fellowship with the Father through Jesus. And we don't have hope because we would all, always wonder if he was pleased or unhappy with us. But the second means a life of joy and relationship. God is close and personal. We, we know because of Jesus rather than anything we did happen during those six hours. Our sin put Jesus there. We couldn't do anything but sin. God set forth his son to rescue us from his wrath. That's what it means to be saved. Regarding our salvation, we could boast if we gave a million dollars to a church or, or a charity. We gave blood. We gave donated organs. We, we did this, that, and the other thing. And they all may be no, no. But they couldn't come close to the sacrifice on the Anything good we do would be like a toddler and his professional baseball player father. The toddler says, Daddy, look, I threw the ball and it lands two feet in front of him. The father knows how much farther he can throw. Jesus told him.
He said two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not like other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I can, he that humbleth himself should be exalted. You know the difference between these two prayers? The religious man pointed out all the flaws of others, and all that was commendable in himself. That's not humility. See that only the flaws of others is arrogance. The second man was a social outcast because he was a collaborator with Roman government. Nearly everyone around him thought he was a traitor. And he prayed, be merciful to me, the sinner. He says his outcast position not causes God's anger. He confesses it so that related to friendship with God is something to be enjoyed. The God who's a dangerous lion becomes to him or her a good God. Another way we know that we've been humbled is that we endure wrong, done how we endure the wrong that's done to us. 1 Peter 2 describes Jesus' death on the cross. It says, Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. He, he didn't kick and scream, being dragged all the way to the cross. He didn't curse at his tormentors as they nailed him to the tree. He patiently endured the great contradiction of sinners against himself because he trusted the Father. Outside God's ability or authority to deal with it. Romans 13 begins, Let every soul be subject to the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. This passage speaks specifically of government, but, but generally applies to anyone who holds leadership to address wrong leadership, but to resist authority that is to rebel against God. Submission to our leaders, whether they're good or bad, shows humility. Receiving correction reveals humility. The black and white pictures of life that the, we aren't, as Westerners, aren't, aren't always comfortable seeing. We like to see things in shades and hues, but things are very black and white in the book of Proverbs, especially Listen to two of them regarding accountability. Proverbs 12, verse 1 says, Whosoever loves instruction loves knowledge. Also fools. If we exalt our own experiences and opinions and agendas of the counsel of sensible believers around us, we're stupid fools. We're more concerned about ourselves than anything else. That's not humility. Humility loves correction. This doesn't mean that we always respond well and immediately means that in the end we realize that what was... But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Forgiveness doesn't harbor hurts. It doesn't nourish them and cherish them and cultivate them. It doesn't nurse them. It doesn't create confirmation bias against them. You know, when somebody does something wrong, yeah, it just proves my point. They're just that idiot I already thought they were. Confirmation bias. Forgiveness releases that wrong that was done to the covering of Christ's blood on forgiving person truly understands propitiation because they're trusting that wrong to God. Thankfulness reveals a humble spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 And everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. To give thanks means that we recognize that we don't deserve what we have and, and what we get. But to thank others is, is to humble ourselves because we realize that we couldn't have done what we did without someone else being in our lives without someone else helping us. Thankfulness represent, uh, recognizes God's grace poured into your life through others. How you talk about others reveals much about your humility. Ephesians 4 tells us this, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger reveal our humility and unmasks our pride. What you say is just the overflow of what already fills your heart. If you bump a cup of tea, tea spills out, not coffee. You speak ill of others, it's 
Because don't expect today's humility to be enough for tomorrow. It, it, it's a moment by moment battle to keep ourselves under that provision. Constant war to make sure that you trust that God judged all sin, even the wrong and the sin that was done to you when he vented his wrath on Jesus in your place. That's what it means to follow Jesus daily. Sometimes people do really unfair. The flip side of that truth is terrifying. For the non-believer, the best thing they will ever experience in this life is the best thing they will ever experience. But there's good news. Romans 2 says, Despiseth thou the riches of his long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads thee to repentance, that you take one more breath, that you were given today means that God withholds his wrath against your sins. Today is proof of God's goodness and kindness toward you. This truth should lead you to repentance, to turn to God for salvation. Don't store up wrath for yourself. It's like taking a loan with a balloon payment. And eventually the conditions of the loan will come due to pay for your sins all at once. The good news is that Jesus was set forth to be your propitiation. He died in your place to bear God's wrath on your sins. Believe now. Believe that, that you are what God says. You are a self-condemned sinner. Believe that nothing you can do can remove you from God's wrath. And believe that Jesus did all that was necessary for salvation. And don't wait to, until the last second is urgent. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. On August 16, 1987, Northwest Airlines Flight 225 took off from Detroit's airport. airport. His holiness would have not allow him to condone them. His love would not allow him to fail to act. He set forth Jesus to be the propitiation for our sin. Jesus bore the full weight of God's wrath against us. Not a shred of wrath was spared. By faith, all who believe on Jesus for salvation have his blood covering them. Uh, covering them. They're, they're eternally protected from God's wrath. They will never again face it. And the realization of what Christ endured for us must humble us. It, it affects our lives. It does not can we say that we've been rescued. The person who begins to grasp the enormity of Calvary will bow low before the cross. And that person's prayer will be, I will humble myself before God's Son. May the Lord give us the grace to Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you in dread and awe. We don't deserve to be here. We deserve the full weight of your just and fair anger against our sins. And yet we are indeed here. And it's only because of the mercy you showed us in Jesus Christ that we ask you to hear and to answer this prayer in his name. We come to you to plead for your Holy Spirit's convincing work in the heart of the person who may be here today watching online, who's never believed on you for salvation. May today be the day that they come before you, trusting Jesus only. May today be the day of their salvation. Lord, we confess as believers that we don't always understand what you did for us at the moment of salvation. Sometimes we don't understand because we just don't take the time to think about it. Other times we're just, please keep the truths of this message before us that we will remain humble before you. And we praise you for what you did for us in Jesus. In